There's been quite a lot of speculation lately about Basel III, especially among many prominent people in the gold community. I have to wait putting out a video on the topic myself. Many have asked my opinion lately, and so I'll provide it in this video. Let's first discuss Basel III and why so many people are expecting it to break the back of the derivatives market and usher in an era of free gold. First, what is Basel III? Briefly, it was an arrangement made by the G20 in November 2010 in response to the global financial crisis that started in 2008. The G20 wrote a new set of financial regulations to ensure capital adequacy and thus prevent banks from overextending themselves in search for a profit. Reserve requirements will be going up. The agreement had as its original goal to enact these regulations sometime between 2013 and 2015, but there have been continuous delays, and so the regulations haven't been enacted yet. What exactly does it mean that reserve requirements will be going up? One of the keys is to understand that bank balance sheets work the opposite way most people think. When people deposit money in the bank, the deposit is an asset for the depositor, but a liability for the bank. When the bank lends out a portion of the funds that are on deposit, the loan contracts are liabilities of the borrowers, but they are assets for the bank. It's the assets of the bank that are marked down when determining the bank's reserve requirements. The reason for this is that the bank counts on repayments of the loans, which are their assets, to maintain their ability to honor their liabilities, the deposits. If any of the bank's assets fail because of the inability of the debtor to pay, the bank's reserves are supposed to provide enough padding that the bank's liabilities, namely its deposits, do not exceed the bank's assets. If that were to happen, the bank would be insolvent. So how could this possibly affect the gold market, you might be asking? To understand this, we have to briefly discuss gold lending. Now, I can't do the subject justice in one short video, so I direct my subscribers who are interested in a more in-depth treatment to watch my video series, Gold, The Truth Hidden in Plain Sight. Many of the world's largest banks trade and lend gold and silver both on behalf of their customers as well as for their own account. The metal that they deal with is either allocated or unallocated. Allocated metal means that the customer is the owner of specifically identified and segregated coins and bars. If a customer owns gold or silver that is allocated and held by the bank, the bank doesn't list them as, as assets on the bank's balance sheet. Unallocated gold and silver is a different story. For an unallocated gold or silver account, the customer is actually an unsecured creditor to the bank. The bank shows gold and silver on their balance sheet, but also shows an offsetting liability, which is its obligation to the customer. Because everyday turnover of precious metals is small relative to the total assets, the bank does not need to maintain physical custody of all of the unallocated metal. In this way, the bullion bank situation is very similar to a bank that deals in cash deposits. Basel III is going to reclassify gold as a tier one asset and is going to impose an 85% funding ratio on gold. This means that for banks who have unallocated gold accounts, they're going to only be able to count 85% of the unallocated metal value on the asset side to cover 100% of the liabilities held on the liability side. This classification, along with the reserve requirement, is going to require bullion banks to increase other reserves in order to hold gold on their books in unallocated form. Many are thinking that this increase in expense is going to disincentivize bullion banks from continuing to operate in gold markets. I think this makes some amount of sense, and there is evidence that we've already seen some of the impact. For example, Deutsche Bank shut down its metals trading business in 2014, and Scotia Bank closed its metals desk last year. But remember, the banks have had years to prepare for this moment. I doubt that we're going to see a slew of new banks exiting the business after the regulation is put in place on Monday. It's more likely that the banks who would be the most hurt have already exited the business. Still, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the case made by the leaders of this uh, gold community. 
Now that we have discussed the main points for why this may provide incentive for the bullion banks to exit the gold derivatives market, let's discuss the types of loopholes that may be exploited by the bullion banks. Precious metals derivatives are very similar to the digital fiat markets that are fractionally backed by paper cash. And let's take a look at how banks utilize the nature of digital money to get around reserve requirements over the past couple of decades. Just as an example of the type of tactics that we might see in the gold market post Basel III. On March 15th of 2020, the Federal Reserve Board reduced bank reserve requirement ratios to 0%. This action eliminated reserve requirements for all depository institutions. Why did they do this? Well, this testimony that I show you here of Fed Governor Larry Meyer before the House Banking Committee holds the key. At one time, the Federal Reserve required depository institutions to hold reserves against their loan book assets. What this meant is that the bank would need to hold either sufficient bank vault cash or sufficient deposits at the Federal Reserve, or both, to meet the reserve requirements. The reserve requirement needed to be met on average over a maintenance period of 14 days. But how was that calculated? It was based upon the balance sheet of the bank at the end of each day for 14 days. Aha, so can the banks easily get around this requirement? Yes, they can. Let's read a snippet of Larry Meyer's 1998 testimony. It says, in recent years, devel developments in computer technology have allowed depositories to begin sweeping consumer transaction deposits into non-reservable accounts. In consequence, the balances that depositories hold at reserve banks to meet reserve requirements have fallen to quite low levels. These consumer sweep programs are expected to spread further, threatening to lower required reserve balances to levels that may begin to impair the implementation of monetary policy. Should this occur, the Federal Reserve would need to adapt its monetary policy instruments, which could involve disruptions and costs to private parties as well as to the Federal Reserve. However, if interest were to be allowed to be paid on reserve, required reserve balances and on-demand deposits, changes in the procedures used for implementing mon monetary policy might not be needed. So what we see here is that digital assets can be very easily reclassified by computers to skirt by reserve requirements. By Larry Meyer's own words, the banks are able to simply reclassify accounts in a way that reduces their reserve requirements. All they need to do to, is uh, to utilize the sweep accounts just prior to the balance sheet being locked in for the purposes of reserve calculations, and then sweep everything back just afterwards. If it sounds like an abuse of the system, well, it clearly is, but the banks were able to get away with it. In fact, as Larry Myers says here, it cost the Federal Reserve to reconsider implementing interest payments on reserve deposits at the Fed as a way to get the banks to actually maintain reserves. Now, what on earth does this have to do with gold, blank P? Let's go back to some information that I presented in my Gold, the Truth Hidden in Plain Sight video. Now, the majority of gold derivatives writing and gold trading takes place in the LBMA system. Here's a snippet of the LBMA's publication, The Guide. It says, London Precious Metals Clearing Limited is at the heart of the local London over-the-counter system. It is a daily clearing system of paper transfers whereby LBMA members offering clearing services utilize the unallocated precious metals accounts that they maintain between each other, not only for the settlement of mutual trades, but also for third-party transfers. Now, I'd like to emphasize the word daily here. At the end of each day, many of the paper transfers cancel each other out. The total amount of metal that actually changes ownership is much less than the volume of transactions would make it appear. The daily clearing means that the fractional reserve gold-backed money only exists for a short period of time on the order of hours. Now, the point that I'm trying to make here is not that all of the derivatives disappear daily. They certainly do not, but most of them cancel each other out daily. And the calculation can be handled very quickly in the digital world by computer. 
Derivatives are digital entities by their very nature. So what would stop banks from utilizing the same type of sweep mechanism that was used to bypass reserve requirements for cash over the past 20 years to bypass them for gold? Think about it. Basel III is going to impose liquidity coverage ratios. How will these be calculated? My guess is that it will be a calculation based upon balance sheets frozen in, in time at specific intervals, maybe daily. If that's the case, then the use of sweep accounts could very well allow bullion banks to continue their operation and continue them profitably. Maybe this is the kind of thing that the majority of bullion banks who have kept their trading desks open know. I don't know if it's the use of sweep accounts that will keep the derivatives market alive, but I do have to ask myself, with all of the time that the banks have had to prepare, why wouldn't more of them have unwound their operations if they didn't have a way of dealing with the new regulations? It's just some food for thought.